All right, good morning. <laughs> so yesterday I got lucky. I got the uh, hour after lunch. Today I got unlucky because you're all sitting there thinking about food and, and getting hungry. And what does my presentation consist of? Pizza. So I would suggest that you all get a glass of water, uh, grab some candy out of the bowl so you can kind of uh, at least make it until we break for lunch. But uh, also keep in mind, this is a, an important presentation because my purpose here today is to make you money and to make you more money and to make your clients more money and to show you simple, easy steps that you can take back with you that are going to do just that. And I promise you, you will at least get that. So I own uh, Turnbow Corporation, which is a consulting training uh, company primarily and then I also uh, we are just launching constantly convert.com uh, and then interrupted.com which is kind of a video um, um, company that we're that we're launching so those are some of the things that I do now as we get into this the first thing I want to know is how many of you have enjoyed some McPizza lately okay you got to get more active than this okay so you're, you're eating McPizza, you, you like it? No one? Has anyone heard of McPizza? No one's had McPizza? Wow. Okay, so a little bit of a trick question there as we get into this. But uh, McPizza was a thing. Record for land speed was shattered at 300 miles an hour. On water, a speedboat made the books at over 200 knots. By 1949, pilots had broken the speed of sound. And now... Oh, ma'am. Here's your pizza. Already? Yes, already. McDonald's pizza is freshly baked in our revolutionary ovens in under five minutes. Okay, maybe it doesn't break the sound barrier, but you've never had pizza so good so fast. You've never had pizza so good so fast. And so no one remembers this. Wow. And how does this relate to conversion optimization, right? So in the mid 80s, uh, burger, uh, McDonald's dominated the burger market, right? For lunch, it was the go-to place for burgers. Now you have all types of smash burgers and burger this and burger that, but they definitely dominated that space. However, people weren't eating burgers for dinner. Um, now, I know a lot of you are like, this sounds a little crazy. You know, I've never had pizza at McDonald's and I think that would be weird. It wasn't crazy because remember the McMuffin? Because there was a time when there wasn't a McMuffin. There was a time when there wasn't breakfast. McDonald's was the burger place, but they introduced the McMuffin and it's still here. That was in the 70s. And breakfast is really big at McDonald's. So there was millions of dollars to be made uh, through breakfast at McDonald's. Now the, the pizza, the McPizza started, and, and this kind of goes back to, to my point and to the point that the lady from Cisco made is that we're still doing all of the things we used to do. We just have better tools and tactics and ways of doing them and being more efficient at them. So hopefully that, that's the lesson you gain from this. So here we go. McDonald's started with the, with the calzone, uh, which was something quick and easy that you could carry with you, uh, do the drive through thing, but that's just not dinner. So they were like, no, that, that's not getting the dinner, the family to sit down. So what can we do? So they brought in these six minute ovens to create these larger pizzas. Uh, they created a family size pizza box. So what was really cool about this is if you can imagine, you always go to McDonald's, you get the little bag of burgers, right? But now you have this family size pizza box. But the only problem was back then they discovered the box won't fit through the drive through window. Big problem, right? So then someone came up with the idea, well, wait a minute, um, we've got an issue with time, we've got an issue with the, the pizza going through the, the window, so let's just redesign our entire window. Let's make it bigger, let's make it longer, let's put lots of glass in, and as they're driving through the drive through they can actually see us making the pizza, and so that experience, that customer experience will be there, so that when they get to the door, they get their family-sized pizza, they don't mind the wait, and everything's good. Doesn't that sound good? What's really interesting, I think, in this is they were thinking of customer experience back then. 
and it's the hot topic today. So what they weren't prepared for is that while they were trying all of these things to optimize the success of the dinner at McDonald's, Pizza Hut was like, hold on a second, we got this. You're stepping into our turf. So Pizza Hut struck back and they did it fierce, guys. They started a campaign literally called, don't make the mistake. <laughs> Why try McFrozen? Okay, they were hitting McDonald's really, really hard for trying to step into their turf. And it's kind of funny because back then they're hitting them with the McFrozen. And who else is hitting them with McFrozen today? Wendy's. Wendy's is all about fresh, never frozen. Uh, that's, that's their thing right now. So they're still hitting McDonald's with that. Um, so the other thing they realized is they had these six minute ovens, they had this beautiful prep station, they had these big windows, they got the box outside the window, but, and then we were promising people you've never had it so good so fast, but we can't get this thing under 10 minutes. How many of you would sit in a drive through at McDonald's for six months supply of Big Macs for 10 minutes? No one. And I love me a Big Mac every now and then. We don't have time for that. So they didn't have time for it either. So it was killing them. Uh, literally, everybody was coming through, having this great experience of watching people make the pizza, you know, get it all prepared. But then the guy comes to the window and they're like, we're sorry, could you pull up front and wait for an hour for this pizza to come out? And pe people were like, no, this is not working. But still, McDonald's persisted. They kept testing, they kept innovating, and for 16 years, they pushed the McPizza, and they pushed it, and they believed in it, and they knew it was gonna work. And most of the restaurants gave up years ago, but one little restaurant, anyone from Ohio? One little uh, franchise owner from Ohio said, we love to sell McPizza, we like McPizza, people like to buy our McPizza and we're gonna sell it. And so they kept selling it until 2012, McDonald's finally came in and they're like, yeah, we know you had that little contract thing, but no, it's not gonna happen. Your, your McPizza's over. And so McDonald's killed the McPizza in 2012. All right, and then we have Domino's, right? So I can tell by most of you in here, a lot of you are still very young, but how many of you remember when McDonald's, I mean, when Domino's was the cheap, greasy, stuck to the cardboard pizza that you get at one or two o'clock in the morning? Okay, there are a few of you in here. And, it, and at times, <laughs> it was exactly what you wanted, right? But what, did, uh, what, what happened with Domino's? Domino's began to flop. It became known as that pizza that just was not good. It was kind of gross. It was very greasy. You know, it showed up like upside down and stuck to the top of the box. And it just built its own brand of being really nasty pizza. So what happened is they brought in a turnaround strategist. And the turnaround strategist or the CEO came in and looked at everything and they're like, oh my God, what are we gonna do with this? And so what did they do? They came up with, let's just be honest. Let's tell people, yeah, our pizza sucks. The way it's been delivered to you is horrible. You do not deserve that. Like you've been getting pizza with all of your, most of your pepperoni stuck to the roof of the box that you can't even eat. And yeah, that's horrible. We shouldn't be doing that. And so here's what Domino's is doing now to stop that. This is what we've added. This is what we've changed. This is the, the new model of Domino's and we're not afraid to tell you what we're doing. And that turnaround agent or that CEO did that despite many people saying you're an absolute idiot for doing that. But look at what happened. If you look at the stock price during the tenure of Patrick Doyle's tenure as CEO of Domino's, Look at where it, where it goes. Look at 2011, about when he came on board, and then look when they really launch, get super launched into the campaign. They're testing it along here. They get super launched in the campaign, and look at where their stock price is, 2018. So this is a very weak slide from Google Images, but I wanna point out at the top of that is Netflix. Right underneath that is Amazon. Is Amazon still in the room? <laughs> Underneath that is Apple. Underneath that, Facebook, 
Google. So did it work? Absolutely it worked. So my point here is that we've always been optimizing, we've always been testing strategies that we want to work or we think will work. We've been testing hypothesis and some fail and some don't. And so when we talk about conversion optimization or conversion rate optimization, there is a difference. It's still what we've always been doing. We're just doing it with different tools, different systems, a little bit more sophisticated, but we've always been doing conversion optimization, or at least I hope we've been doing it because the successful companies have. Now, what does it take to be successful at conversion optimization? First of all, you have to be willing to rip up all of the roadmaps at any given time. So if you've got a CEO who lives and dies by this culture, this strategy that's never going to waver or change, it's probably not going to work at that organization. It has to be a company that embraces change. They have to be an agile company. And this all comes from the leadership. So if you're in one of those roles where you're trying to implement uh, true optimization and your leader's not bought into it, you're probably going to need a new job in about a year or two if you keep pushing against that because they have to be on board and they have to lead uh, from the top of this. Um, one of the things that we've run into as a, as a, on the digital agency side of things is everybody's like, you know, to get our conversions up and to get more sales, we feel like we've got to go through another redesign. How many of you remember going through like a redesign every two to three years of your site? And maybe you're in the middle of it right now. We need to stop that, okay? A complete redesign is just not necessary. And the reason we're doing redesigns is we're not doing optimization correctly. So how do you do optimization correctly? What does the path look like? So obviously, the simplistic path is you have a, discovery, a, a time of discovery and setting goals. And then you evaluate and analyze those goals. You create a hypothesis of what you think is going to happen. And then of course you do some testing. You don't want to go like dominoes. They didn't go full steam ahead with the strategy. They tested that strategy and it was working. And then they decided to go full steam ahead. You look at the reporting and then you continually optimize. So to today, you know, optimizing the business to me is the same conversation with SEO. It never ends. It should never end. We should always be constantly converting, right? Or constantly optimizing. So when you look at the process itself, you have the analyzation stage you're, where you're basically looking at data and what you want to do here is look at what can you find in the data not necessarily what the data is telling you but what can you find within the data um, you want to be able to experiment or craft new web experiences uh, prioritize your hypothesis which i'm going to show you how to do that obviously you need a lot of research as to what and why is happening you're going to use quantitative qualitative research as well and then you're going to ge generate a lot of insights or determine, you know, based on this data, based on this analyzation, what is possible, um, what is actionable from the research. Um, so if we kind of con consolidate down that down into keys, then the thing to remember is that we, it needs to be continuous. We need to be careful with hacks and best practices. One of the top questions I get all the time is, is what's the best practice for this? Um, and you have to be careful with that because, you know, what's a best practice for some, for another business is not the best practice for your business. And obviously what's best practice for your competitor, even in the same field might not be the best practice for your business, because even though you sell the th same things, you may have a different strategy and that's extremely important. You need to designate someone. So if you have that person who's constantly, um, complaining <laughs> or criticizing or challenging. I always call it look for the challenger in the room because they are obviously a great person to lead um, the optimization process. And then also remember that it is an art and a science. So there is data that is important, but it's a data supported journey. You don't want to totally depend on the data. So if you're going to assemble a team to do optimization the right way, 
Considering that we're all understaffed, right, this is what the smallest team would look like. You would basically have a project manager, you would have a data analyst because someone's got to be analyzing data, right? And then you've got the designer or the creative person. And then you have the copywriting because you can't just say anything. It needs to be important and it needs to be just like she was talking about with Facebook having the long um, uh, comments versus the short, you know, I love this. And then you're sharing something. You got to tell them why you love it. So copywriting obviously plays into this. And then, of course, uh, the developer that's going to make these changes on the site and perform the A-B testing. Now, what's really cool about this is you've got, you know, five positions here, but that can be consolidated down into two or three uh, positions just wearing a couple of different hats. So that's a t small team and what it looks like. The other thing is when you're thinking about data driven, a lot of times when we do these talks, we talk about the type of data, but we don't really give you ideas or suggestions as to how you can get that data. So as a company, we use many different vendors, many different platforms. None of these are sponsors or paid, obviously. So I'm just giving you some different platforms that I think are great to work with when you're doing optimization. Kissmetrics, HubSpot, a lot of you are familiar with that. Google Optimize. How many of you are familiar with Google Optimize? It's fairly, fairly new. If you haven't jumped on board with Google Optimize, it's, it's awesome. Uh, very easy to use, small business, large corporation, whatever. Uh, Adobe, of course. Anyone using heat maps and scroll maps? Wow, that's awesome. Okay, I can slip, skip that slide later. Uh, Forms, um, Optimizely, uh, a great company uh, used quite often. Uh, visitor recordings, uh, very helpful in all of this uh, data-driven process. Scroll maps, most of you are familiar with that, love those. Um, visitor recordings, very cool. You see where people are clicking and where they're going on the, on the given web page. Um, but so beyond the data, now let's go back to the funnel because we're always managing that funnel. But when we're optimizing, what we typically don't do is break it down to what does, what does each step look like for the customer? And so we talk about customer journey, but in optimization, that's extremely important because you are going to create an hyp a hypothesis, but it needs to be based on what the customer's expecting and what they're actually doing. And so what I want you to do is take just this five step. This is, you know, pretty much every funnel looks like this in some capacity. But what we don't do is say, okay, for the awareness portion of our cycle, what does that look like to the customer? What does the awareness stage look like? What are they seeing? Where are they experiencing our brand during the awareness cycle? Same thing for consideration stage, the qualified stage and the decision stage. And when they become a customer, what does that look like? What does it feel like for someone to become a customer with our company? Do we just say, Thanks for checking out. See you later. You know, I loved his uh, comment about uh, the thank you, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. But what does it look like to be a customer of ours? What is that experience like? And then to start this journey, you're going to have several of these, but you got to at least have one. So you're going to create a hypothesis, which is basically just, I think that if we do this, then this is going to happen, right? So that's pretty easy. That's the easiest part. And then which metrics do we improve first? So in my opinion, I begin with the end in mind and work backwards. And the reason is because our goal here is ROI, it's sales. And so if we work from the end back, then we're optimizing first with the most importance, sales. And then we optimize ourselves back. And to kind of explain that, if I were going to optimize your site today and I only had one thing I could focus on and I was going to do it for free, which would you rather have a 20% increase in conversions on your homepage or 20% increase in traffic to your homepage or 20% increase in traffic or conversions either on your checkout page? That's a no brainer, right? So a lot of us start with our homepage and we work our way through the entire site. And so it's a year long process. And in December, we have started optimizing our checkout page 
do that in January. You know, be ready for that before the season kicks in. So how do you prioritize? You could have like 20 different hypotheses. You know, you've got your team brainstorming, you got all these great ideas, so how do you prioritize? prioritize that? So there's a lot of different methods out there. And so the one that we've uh, stuck with is take a look at sales value and effort and time and then divide that by three. And basically what you're looking at is what can we get the most bang for our time? So what's going to take the least amount of effort, the least amount of time, the least amount of eff uh, resources, but it's going to give us the best result or the biggest bang for our buck. And that's how you prioritize. The other thing that I hear a lot, people ask me, you know, Jeff, what, you know, on our checkout page, we're having some issues with that. We want to try to some things that are different. What color is best for people uh, to check out? And I'm like, you know, I'm not an expert on color. I'm not an expert on psychology and you really don't need to be one. You know, that's way too deep. The questions we need to be asking is first of all, not which is the best color to convert, but where do most people get stuck in the buying process of our site? And we can get that data. We know where people get stuck and we make changes there, not necessarily down to the point of which type of color, but if you obviously don't have a color differentiator on your add to cart, let's just try any color <laughs> that stands out and let's see how that works. But where do most people get stuck in the buying process is very important. What are common traits among our paying customers? You know, getting to know your customer and what their expectations are and how you can personalize that journey as they're going to the checkout. And when I say checkout, I also mean the conversion page. So if it's a service oriented business, it could be a contact us page. It could be a, um, a whatever. So it's not necessarily a checkout page. Um, what hesitations do our leads have that prevent them from buying? Where is the point where they begin to hesitate or kind of fall out of the process? Um, one always comes to mind here, um, an example that uh, used to drive me nuts, but basically we buy a lot of domain names. And so we would go to this domain provider and we would purchase this domain name for like 12 bucks and then we would get to this, we start the checkout process and now all of a sudden we've got $300 worth of products and we have to unselect what we don't like. And so 15 minutes later, we get to actually purchase that domain. Some of you know who I'm talking about, right? We don't need to name names there. So that process has changed by the way. So they were AB testing that and it failed. What I'm talking about is something like this, where you go and you purchase a $10.99, $10.99 domain name, and immediately your cart goes to $93. And my first reaction is, well, crap, how did that happen? And then I'm like, okay, how did it happen? And so I've got this total page here, of just lots of white space, lots of numbers. And I'm like, okay, I guess I have to go in and hit all of these trash cans and take out what I don't like I don't want to mess up and do and not you know include something that I do want oh and I see they've given me five years not one year I only need it for one year so I'm spending so much time trying to get what I wanted in the first place don't do that um, so they are actually changing that process I don't know if many of you have been in, involved in in their their process but that has definitely changed I mean, there were literally like seven pages for you to be able to purchase this $10 domain. And now it's one. The other thing we often forget is that we're optimizing for a direct result and we forget about the nurturing part. So it is important to start with the end in mind. And of course we want to optimize for those uh, checkouts, for those purchases, for those people who are requesting a quote or uh, requesting a bid, whatever it is. But we also need to be optimizing for the nurturing por portion of this as well. So we want to optimize for email signups, demos, white paper downloads, whatever the conversion points are on your pages. Don't forget about those when you're focused in on the final point, which is the purchase point or the main direct call to action. And the winner is for all of the testing that's out there. And I can promise you when you go to Optimizely or, or Google Optimize or Kissmetrics or whatever, you know, we all know there's data overload, right? 
And we know that as much data that's out there, let's be honest, how much of it are we really, really watching and using? Okay, so if you're going to take the kind of the 80-20 KISS method approach to things, A-B testing is by far, most agree with this, is the best way of optimizing whatever it is that you're trying to do. So when you use these different sites, Optimizely or Google Optimize or whatever it is, go immediately to A-B testing, make the changes on the page, send 20% of your audience to that page or 40% of your audience to that page and see what happens. And that is just a fast way to get some results um, about the, cha the minor changes that you're making on your page. So yeah, so the color obviously has an important uh, impact on your uh, checkout. So when you're doing A-B testing, you know, don't worry too much about the, the science of color, just change it. You know, in this instance, it was all green. In this instance, you just changed it to yellow. It could have been, it could have been orange. But the point is having a different color simply increased the rate of conversion by 35%. So these are the kinds of A-B testing and tweaks and small changes that can make a huge difference in how many checkouts actually happen. Look at your creative um, and A-B test that as well because what you'll find is great creative when slightly changed can have a totally different effect. You know, you see this image a lot, but not necessarily in this context, so that's why I used it. So in this case, you know, if you're selling diapers, everyone here is going straight to the baby's face because it's cute, right? We all like babies. So we look at the babies, but then we kind of avoided everything else and we went away. But when the baby's paying attention to the content, we pay attention to the content because we want to know why is he paying attention to the content. So just that one tweak in creative and A-B testing gives these kinds of results, which are pretty drastic results, right? And it's just a minor tweak. So tips, tricks, uh, quick things that you can kind of take home, little snackables. On your homepage, and people, what's really cool about this, or makes me feel better, is that a lot of the other speakers have already covered some of these points. So I'm just driving those points home at this point. On the home page, I use the five second rule. It, you know, someone mentioned a three second rule. I'm cool with that too. But basically in the first five seconds, if you can't tell them why they're there and why you're the, why you have what they need and why they need to purchase from you, then you need to re-examine the home page. Are they in the right place? On the home page, they want to know, first of all, that they're in the right place. Um, they also want to be able to trust and have confidence in you. So keep that in mind as well. If you've won an award, if you've got security seals, whatever it is, apply that trust and confidence. Don't forget that. Why they need to do something. So don't just put this huge button there and say, you know, uh, purchase now. You know, purchase now to save 20%. Or go here to learn how to blah, blah, blah. So give them a reason of why they need to do that something that's on your homepage. So for many of you, I would go look at your homepage today and I would look at, okay, we maybe we have our conversion actions in the right place on the homepage and we're telling them what they need to do, but we're not telling them why they need to do it or we're not incentivizing them as to why they need to do it. And then we always need to be able to show them or tell them what's gonna happen next. So keep that in mind on your homepage. If you go here, this is going to happen, or this result's gonna happen, or this benefit, even better, is gonna happen. Okay, so we're almost wrapping up here. It's almost lunch time, so you know, you're good. We're not gonna go over, so hang on. Fast tips. I loved his point because it was my number one point in, under fast tips. Optimize the thank you. We have forgotten to be human. We have forgotten to give an appropriate thank you. But if you send out just, you know, literally, I had this exact same phrase that he used. If you send out a thank you and it's warm and it invites them to go look at other products and services that you have, you know, because you liked this, we think you're going to like this. And as a thank you, we're going to offer you this. You would be surprised that if you optimize again with the end in mind with that thank you, you would be surprised at what the results will happen as far as return checkouts, multiple checkouts, and the value per checkout. 
use one metric in the A-B testing. And for me with e-commerce, I look at revenue per customer. There's different uh, models, uh, different ideas. But for me, I look at revenue spend per customer when I'm A-B testing. Uh, interrupt them. When they're in the process of going through your website, we all by nature are curious. So a lot of people, especially if you're looking at a site that has you know, an average of 10 pages that are, that are being looked at, you know, keep in mind they're wandering around, they're curious. Well, you need to start telling them where to go. Tell them where you want them to go. Lead them down the path. So put those, put those images in place. Put those buttons in place that says, you know, to do this, go here. Next step is here. So tell them where you want them to go. Um, CTA versus design. I'm sorry if you're in the design field, but CTA wins. Um, uh, declutter. So I'm working with someone right now that wants, they're in the outdoor space and they want this beautiful outdoor scene on their page and they've got this mock up and it's driving me nuts because it's so like too much. It's beautiful design, but it's too much. We have become so fast paced that when we land again on that home page, it's like, you know, do you have what I need? Do you have what I want? Where can I get it? I want to get there. Yeah, it's cool that you have cool design, but I want to get from point A to point C. And so declutter, declutter, and then go back and ask yourself, did we really declutter? And that's how you know that you've decluttered. Get that? So those are hopefully some, some ideas and tips that you can take away. Hopefully you got, did anyone get three to five points? out of that session of, of what might help. Good, good, thanks. Then I've done my job and I traveled all the way from Arkansas to be here and it was a, and it was a success. <laughs> so uh, I know you're hungry, but if anyone wants to ask questions now, we can do that or we can meet outside and ask questions. It's totally up to you. Um, you can always check me out at jeffturnbow.com or constantlyconvert.com. Um, they're telling us back there that I need you to go to lunch. So, um, oh, we don't need to go to lunch. Ah. Uh, sorry, I'll just, um, uh, hey, can you hear me? No. <laughs> uh, um, it's just the hot food is going to be there at like 12.30. So if we leave now, the hot food won't be there. The hot sandwiches. Oh, so did I end early? Yeah. Wow. You've okay. got till 12.30 to entertain us. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I'm also a hip hop dancer. So if yeah. you could give me some music, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. So let's talk about conversion. Let me, you know, maybe I went too fast through this um, slide deck. So does anyone have um, anyone in the, what was the question I asked earlier and hands went up and I was actually surprised. Um, it was was it heat maps? No, scroll maps and heat maps and, and video recording. Who's using that? Okay, any vendors that I didn't mention that maybe are, have been helpful for you? No, I would say that you didn't mention that we are just starting with resource intensive and required development skills, but we're working on setting up using uh, Xbox Connect, the peripheral uh, like in-office eye tracking, so that we can bring user testers into the office to do eye tracking like you showed on that uh, baby website. Um, internally, there are like, that used to be something you 100% needed a vendor for, um, and it was very expensive because they sold it as a complete service, but with some development ability and available peripherals, if you want to, that's something you can set up internally and run your own tests on. Oh, so you could bring in your own uh, test market, bring in 20 customers or whatever, put them in front of your and use Xbox for that. Yeah, the Xbox Connect, the little peripheral. Yeah. Thing, uh, I mean, it's an eye tracking device that Microsoft sells. Is it an app? Did um, no, there are some, you can look online, there are some open source uh, programs that have been developed. There's like an open API for the Connect. Okay. Um, in the like, Microsoft Xbox developers world. Okay. Um, and you can use it for any kind of motion tracking with the head or with the eyes. Okay. Really good. I like that. Um, what else? Anyone else having success with any of the vendors that I've mentioned or any um, cool tips, tricks that you found in this space when optimizing? Because I'm still learning too. I mean, we're always learning. So 
any of those are, are always helpful and especially if we share it in a conference setting like this. Yes. Just time. Um, so you mentioned at the beginning um, that when you wanted to um, buy something online, you purchase something, you thought that it's $10 and in the end it was uh, $92. Um, and probably because many items that are already pre-selected. So how do you see this active selection in terms of the customer experience? Is it something or how it can be optimized to don't be something that people are hated? Yeah, you're talking about the domain experience? Well, that is the example that you use, but yes. I think there are some multiples, like you buy a, a phone, a mobile phone online, and then you get an active selection, um, you buy the insurance with it as well. I love or, that. Or you buy, um, let's say, um, a fly ticket, mm -hmm. and then you have pre-selected the insurance for traveling and some other uh, services that maybe you need them or you don't need them. So I was wondering how you can optimize. That's a great question. So let me try to find this slide. So I think in this case, it's not what they were doing, but how they were doing it. I don't mind that they wanted to try to give me add-ons because there's actually value in a lot of these add-ons. And you know, we're an agency, so we don't need website builders ever. So they could know that based on our history and always eliminate that. That would be really good personalization for them. Um, because we never buy that product or they could they often call us as well and ask questions so that if they found out that we're never going to buy a website builder then just take that out of our process but I think it's not what they're doing again it's, it's how they're doing it so in this particular case um, I always for some reason I always go to Wayfair Wayfair does a lot of things really great um, so for example when I went to purchase or went to shop for the lounge chairs for outside by the pool so I have the lounge chair in the shopping cart at the top and across here are five different photos of matching sets of furniture that would go with those lounge chairs. So the table chair said the umbrella. So I think in this case, if they would have my main purchase at the top and then have those items listed here for me to quickly add into the cart, I think the organization is the problem here. So, I, I, I mean, I don't mind the add-ons, um, but I also think it's better to give the customer the ability to select than to deselect. And so far in our experience in testing, that's been more effective as well. And I think they're changing because th uh, they've gone from this five-page process, which was very annoying, to at least this one-page process. Um, what else? Any of you done this? This is not just a great experience for the purpose of optimization. This is a great experience for marketing and, and almost all departments, sales, whatever it is. But, you know, we always talk about awareness, but a lot of our teams or a lot of the departments they don't realize, we know what we're doing for the awareness stage, we know what tactics we're using, but we don't understand what the customer is experiencing in these stages. What, how do they experience this? Especially once they become a customer. I think if you do this, it's extremely insightful and enlightening because we really need to know what it's like to be our customer. What is that experience like? Um, I can think of several great companies who continuously make it a great experience by thanking you or, you know, sending you next week, you know, because you did this, you're a loyal customer, we're going to offer you this. And then I can think of companies that when I purchase from them, I never hear from them again. And I think there's more of those <laughs> than the other, than the other, the thank you side. Any of you redesigning versus optimizing? It's okay, because a lot of people are doing it. Okay, so was this of value to you to maybe take back and instead of just completely killing everything and going through the whole rebuild process, you know, let's, let's think about how we can optimize what we currently have versus um, 
rebuild from scratch. Sure. Hmm. Um, they all, they pretty much all kind of do the same things. Uh, they just do them differently. Um, for example, Optimizely and Google Optimize uh, are going to offer you heat maps and scroll maps, um, visitor recordings. Uh, we've been using Optimizely for a long time. I love uh, all of the advice and tips and weekly and daily tips that they provide about what's new, what's changing. They're constantly, <laughs> they're constantly optimizing <laughs> and they're constantly communicating that out to their customers. So I really love that because there's always something new and cool that they're doing. Google Optimize is new and it's very, very user friendly. So if you're a very small staff, uh, if you don't have data analytics, a specialty person to do that if you're the person that's in charge of that and you're really a creative person then it's built really I think for the SMB for for that purpose uh, but right now you're not getting those uh, too many like tips and tricks and 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 constant communication um, forms um, I can't remember someone mentioned a great uh, form source yesterday um, can't remember which one it is, but we use the same one. Um, and then Kiss Metrics uh, works a lot of like Google, lot like Google Analytics, just kind of goes a little bit deeper. Um, so that's why I placed all of them on here. We get a little nugget from each one of them, but they all kind of do the same things. If that makes sense. This is a really good one to get the team kind of bu team buy-in, you know, because it's like, oh, optimizing is uh, such a big, strange world, but really it's not. We've always been doing optimizing with different tools and tactics. Um, you know, if McDonald's were using these um, tactics back then in the 70s, they probably wouldn't have invested into the windows uh, for the boxes and the, and the huge glass drive through because obviously that's no longer there, right? So, you know, it's just about efficiencies. And so I think that's where we're at now. We're still doing the same thing they did back then. We're just able to do it much faster. And it's not going to take us two decades to figure out that the pizza box is probably not a good idea. <laughs> So that was that was a good takeaway from that story. Sure. Um, question: I'd love to get your opinion of or your feedback on a lot of what you discussed uh, in this talk, which has been really helpful. Mostly focuses on on-page optimizations, um, but I come from an agency where we do a lot of redesigns, but also a lot of optimization work on our clients' websites, and we have always investigated and in some cases prioritized uh, structural optimization. So reorganizing of the nav, eliminating unnecessary pages, combining pages to try and streamline the navigational experience and get people uh, on a shorter path to purchase. Mm -hmm. But I'm curious, you know, your experience in that and, and if you've seen ROI in those structural changes and stuff like that. Yeah, good point. So yeah, there's, there's 80 more slides that could have been in this presentation and that certainly should have should have been in there as far as the navigation menu and so our advice basically is to look at web pages now unless you're like an e-commerce uh, uh, you know massive e-commerce site but for the most part try to think it's more like a, a big landing page you know and every page is almost a landing page that's built to convert to some sort of action and we could go back to the nurturing versus the direct because you know maybe your home page is not about getting them to purchase but it's getting them to go somewhere where they can see what it is that they're shopping for and easily start that process so yes absolutely i my opinion is is declutter 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 including the navigation menu um, and you can you know it's really kind of surprising that we look at Google Analytics and we focus on these certain pages, but sometimes we don't ever think of decluttering, which really is so easy because if you look at a, a website over six months or a year and you see that you've got five pages or 10 pages in your navigation menu that never get clicked, 
really there there's no use to have them in the first place because no one's finding them even if they're important you need to either reorganize that or get rid of it because it's not relevant so that's a lot of the things that we do is is declutter is is so helpful in optimizing um, the less is more strategy is certainly important i was trying to find that slide because it's actually really good kind of guide so yeah so maybe on your you know depending on your type of business you know if you're agency or consultant maybe the goal on the first page is to get that white white paper download because your goal is to call on them not necessarily get them to call on you so now that you've got their information that's a lead you've got that lead that's driven but then maybe on the next page you have them to calculate the results of what that would look like if they were to work with you related to that white paper so I think of di if different pages on the website being basically a landing page and there's some sort of ultimate conversion goal which is direct but there's also a nurturing goal on that page as well and I want to optimize for both of those and that my friends is how fast 12 minutes can go because we are pretty much there so unless you have any other questions going to toss it back to our MC and thank you so much for your time and I've uh, really enjoyed it so far and uh, hopefully you got some nuggets from this and and it'll help out thanks thank you so much Jeff that was terrific